Thank you for joining us for today's Cultivating Success webinar. Today's topic is biosecurity, and we're really excited to be sharing the top three biosecurity tips for small acreage livestock owners. This is the Cultivating Success webinar. Cultivating Success was established in 2000 to support the success of small acreage farmers and ranchers in Idaho and Washington. And we're really happy to have been able to partner for so many years with Washington State University Extension, Rural Roots, and Extension educators from across Idaho. Today's presenter is Rebecca Mills, and she is a livestock, small farms, and 4-H edu educator down in Southwest Idaho, specifically Gem and Boise counties, and is part of our Cultivating Success team. I'm Colette DePhelps, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. So just a couple of webinar tips. If you're experiencing any bandwidth issues, you might want to close the other programs that are running on your computer to dedicate all of your bandwidth to the webinar. If you have problems with your sound, you can always type into the chat. We'll let you know if that's on your side or perhaps on the side of our speaker. We do have a call-in number that was provided in your welcome email. If you decide to call in and use your telephone for sound, you're going to want to mute your computer sound when using the phone so you don't get feedback. At any time, you can type questions for Rebecca into the Q&A box, which you can find in the control bar, which is generally located at the bottom of your screen. Please try to keep your questions in the Q&A box because that makes it easy for us to keep track of them. And then in the chat, please go ahead and type any uh, questions you have in terms of technology. Mackenzie Lawrence, the Cultivating Success Program Coordinator, is standing by to help you with technical issues. This webinar is being recorded and it and the handouts for the webinar are posted on the Cultivating Success website. So you'll be able to go back and visit it or share it with friends. Also, if you did register up until about 10.15 a.m. Pacific this morning, I sent you quite a few handouts for today's webinar. If you registered later this morning and did not receive those handouts, please go ahead and put your email into the chat and I will make sure to send those to you at the beginning of Rebecca's presentation. So that's all the tech tips that I have for you this morning. So I'm going to go ahead and hand the webinar over to Rebecca. Thanks for being here, Rebecca. We're excited about your presentation. Well, I am excited to be here today. Let me get my presentation up and we'll make sure it's all in the right way. Everybody's seeing my, my lead slide there? Yes, it's looking all great. Right. All right. Yes, thank you for being here. I'm I'm I get really excited about livestock and talking about livestock and biosecurity is one of those areas that it's it's become a little bit of a focus area for me as I as I've been with the University of Idaho Extension these last several years. And this uh, lead slide here, um, while I'm while I'm telling you about these pictures at the top, I would like to get to know you a little bit. Um, so if you could. Kind of a random little icebreaker. If you could own any type of livestock that, um, like wild, crazy, your favorites, whatever, any type of livestock, what would it be? So put that in the chat, and I'll I'll look at those in this in just a second. As Colette mentioned, my name is Rebecca Mills, and I am an extension educator in Southwest Idaho, Jim and Boise counties, and my focus areas uh, are livestock and small acreage. And these pictures across the top um, are actually animals, like straight up animals my husband and I have owned over the years. Uh, we tried our hand at raising pigs one time. We had them on a goat we got for free. We had lambs and uh, that started out as a bummer lamb project that we ended up with babies and oh my goodness, chickens and orphan calves. And it's always been my job to teach the babies to eat and then send them down the road or raise them. Uh, currently we live on 160 acres in Southwest Idaho. We have a little batch of cows, a horse, two and a half chickens because one's really old and doesn't lay very well anymore, but I just can't let her go. And a um, couple cats, geriatric dog, and seven month old baby twins at my house. It's a full and wonderful life. Um, and I'm excited just to, to share my livestock passion with you today. So let's, ch let's check in some of those, some of those chats, see what we got. We got milk goats, awesome. Jersey cow, the big one is fantastic. Sheep, Ron Patterson, I didn't know you were a sheep man. That's awesome. Um, great to, to 
to get to know you a little bit. My goals today with us um, in this, as we're here together, I hope that you learn the definition of biosecurity. I hope you understand the potential routes of contamination that might enter your property and the risks that are on your property. And then I wanna help you make a plan to mitigate those risks as we move through um, keeping our animals healthy and um, being a good steward over the things that we have on our property. All right, there's two of those. Tip number one, know what biosecurity is and is not. <clears throat> I like the following definition of biosecurity. Biosecurity is a set of steps that we take to prevent animals from being infected with or spreading pathogens. In other words, we wanna keep our animals healthy and in order to protect them from harm that may come from off our farm or protect the other livestock off our farm from things that we might have, we have some work to do. And that's what biosecurity is in a nutshell for me. Some aspects of biosecurity will be the same for all of us. You know, um, but if you're raising different types of livestock than I am, and then you might have different different practices that you'll take on. But when it comes down to the nitty gritty, um, biosecurity isn't regulated. It's not mandated. It's not overseen by any outside organization. Sometimes if you're part of a co-op or you're part of an organization where um, you're all trying to do things the same way, then you might have similar practices. But in reality, biosecurity in a lot of ways is a good faith effort that we all put in to be responsible stewards over our resources. And so we're gonna talk about best practices today. We're gonna to talk about different things. Um, so I want you to put in the chat now, um, things that come to mind for you when you think about biosecurity. You know, given this um, little bit of introduction that I've given so far, the definition, what are you doing to um, keep your healthy animals healthy or protect other animals from any pathogens that might exist on your farm? Give it just a second to do that. What are you doing to keep healthy animals healthy? Um, what comes to mind when you think biosecurity? Limit visitors, dedicated farm shoes. I like that. We're, we're definitely going to talk about those that principle for sure. I like that. Oh, prevent avian flu. We have some. Um, Poultry farmers on the call on the webinar today. Absolutely. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move to, to tip number two because that's gonna lead us into talking about some of these best practices of biosecurity. And the <clears throat> foundational principles that I want to visit with you about today can be summed up in an acronym. And this acronym comes actually from a 4-H lesson plan. You know, part of my job is 4-H youth development. I, I don't think a lot of times um, when we're new to learning something, we're not very much different than a young person learning something, even as adults. And so this lesson plan comes from Michigan 4-H, but I really like the way it summed up um, biosecurity with this acronym. And the acronym is um, CHIP. So CHIP stands for cleanliness, history, isolation and proper management practices. And if you were, um, some of the handouts that you were able to get from um, an email from Colette just a bit ago, or that will be with this recording um, on the Cultivating Success website, there's a handout where you can, you can write some of these things down. So cleanliness, history, isolation, and proper management practices. We'll go through each of those. Okay, so since cleanliness, I want you to think in your mind's eye, take a tour of your property today. And how clean is it? How are you handling waste that comes from your animals? Um, do you have an area where you can separate sick animals from healthy animals? Um, are you cleaning your tools and equipment? Do you have a specific traffic pattern so as to not spread illness or pathogens from one area to another? And as mentioned in the chat, what about those visitors to your farm? How are you handling their, um, their traffic? You know, are, do you have a way that, that um, isn't to separate them from, from your animals in such a way so that they, they aren't sharing things with your animals? Are you requiring a certain standard of cleanliness for people to come on your farm? And what about wild animals and birds? That was mentioned in the chat as well. Are they able to interact with your facilities, tools, equipment, feed? No. Is your feed just in an open bin where all the mice and all the whatever pests can get in there and, and impact 
the cleanliness and, and health of that feed. So just in those questions, we're able to pull out some best practices. All right, let's talk about waste management. We need our waste management to be um, away from our water sources. We need to make sure that it's not a, a hazard to the health of our animal. When our animals are living in pens that are ankle deep with, with um, their own muck and manure, it's just not healthy for our animals. It's gonna be really difficult for those animals to gain weight properly or just manage their own body temperature and regulate their body, body functions. When we think about tools and equipment, um, I mean, if the principle applies across lots of things in our life, the, the idea of cross-contamination. It can be in the kitchen when you're making cookies. I learned that in, in um, as a 4-H cooking kid, that you, know, you don't use the same measuring spoon for the oil as you do the flour. Or um, when it comes to tools and equipment on the farm, if you're, um, even with, with your plants, you know, if you're cutting off a diseased branch off a tree, you don't want to use those same tools without cleaning them to cut to trim your other trees because you might just be passing those diseases around. So when it comes to livestock, thinking through things like water buckets and um, or um, the, the handling equipment that they're using. So you, you doctor an animal in the squeeze chute and then you pull your next animals into the squeeze chute and in, into the same environment that you were just handling pathogens or um, viruses, diseases, those kind of things, the likelihood that your other animals are going to catch those is very actually high. Um, being able to separate your sick animals, and then we'll talk about that more in the isolation category, but what, how is the cleanliness, how is the traffic patterns on the farm? Um, when, um, and thank you, Mackenzie put the biosecurity chip handout into the chat. If you um, haven't accessed that for you, through your email or um, that's what I'm referencing here with these, these uh, slides with the chip uh, um, acronym. All right, another, another way for you, another time for you to participate. In the chat, do you have a cleanliness tip or practice that you use on your farm that you'd like to share with the group? What is it that's something you do to keep things clean on your farm that can help your biosecurity? You know, if it's something that I just mentioned that you think, oh, I want to do that now, I'd love to love to have you um, love to have you put that in the chat. And while you're doing that, I think I'll, I'll move on to the next subject: hand washing for sure. Especially if you have visitors on your on your farm, being able to have a designated hand washing area. Um, it's something that's actually been kind of interesting in my home. So we just we brought home these seven month old babies, right? And we have a kitchen sink that is our everything sink. We don't have a separate sink that when you come in from the back 40 to handle in the cows that you all of a sudden can wash up in the mudroom. And it became a biosecurity pondering for me when I was now washing baby bottles and all those things of like, wow, this sink is really an all the things sink. So I need to think differently about my own um, biosecurity at my home. Take the shoes off between the house and the chicken coop, for sure, absolutely. Um, wipes in a bucket available to wipe down your equipment, foot baths, great, great cleanliness things. Thank you very much for putting those in the chat. All right, history. Um, this concept is about knowing where your animals come from and what kind of treatments they receive prior to becoming part of your farm and ranch. As you might have, as you might recall my beginning slides, I mentioned that we got a free goat or we got a bummer lamb or an orphan cat. <laughs> like that's a lot of the times the way the livestock have, livestock have come into our lives is we've acquired them from various sources. Somebody wanted to get rid of this. Um, believe me, if somebody wants to give you a free animal, there's nothing free about owning livestock. They're actually giving you maybe more of a headache than you really want. But one of the downsides, one of the downsides, sure there's upsides, but the, is that you don't know the history of this animal necessarily. Um, we, our first cattle that we bought, we were ready. We had our property, wanted own cattle. We went to the sale yard and bought um, bred cows. And we had no idea what their history was. We didn't know where they came from. We didn't know who their previous owners were. 
we realized later that the black cow that had four brands had four brands for a reason. We put ours, our iron on her. She stayed at our house for a couple of years and then she went down the road. But those animals come to you, don't always come to you with a log book of their history. So understanding where your animals come from can be very valuable to keeping healthy animals healthy and protecting the animals that are on your farm. It's also really important to know what diseases can impact the species that you have on the farm. If you are a poultry producer or a cattle producer, you're not going to need to be concerned about the same things, right? So um, knowing what diseases impact your species that you're interested in raising and then being able to prepare prepare for that once you um, invite those species onto your farm. And in the vein of keeping healthy animals healthy, what was the vaccination protocols that your animals came with? When you know the breeder, when you're buying from a reputable source, when you're um, sourcing your animals in such a way that, uh, that they, they're able to give you those records, you can carry on that vaccination protocol if you choose, or you can decide on your own, but at least knowing that they came how they came to you so that you know how they might be impacting the animals you might already have on your place or what you can do to move forward. And um, this bullet point about records, records, records. Record keeping is actually a subject that I really like to talk about too, because um, it's something that we can all do and it really impacts the your ability to um, have success with your, with your livestock, I think. Um, it's a skill that can be developed and there's a million things that you can keep, keep records on and not all of them are important, but health records are one thing that you can't go wrong keeping track of. And be, not only for your own sake and your own, um, your own um, profitability, being able to you know, make sure that you know what you spent last year on health, health treatments and uh, keeping your animals healthy, but also for if you were to be selling your animals to be able to pass that information along. So um, when you inherit something from the sale yard or from your neighbor and not and don't know when they don't come with that logbook, it really impacts the the next letter in the acronym, which is um, isolation. So isolation uh, is important because there's a certain incubation time, right? If your animal, if you're new to this animal, um, you want to learn about them and isolation can help you with that. You want to, you want to be able to separate new animals for a minimum of two weeks, really beneficial to be able to do it for 30 days, but um, a minimum of two weeks because whatever is happening in that animal health wise should show up in that time frame. You will be able to see monitor them for, okay, they're, this is the way they got here. Maybe they were really stressed out in, the, in, their, in their transportation to you. And so that'll give them time to calm down and get used to their environment. It'll give you time to uh, get to know them. It's a really important factor actually in handling livestock is being able to be, um, be with them and have them get to know you and you get to know them. You understand their, their um, temperament and things. But from a biosecurity standpoint, being able to notice, okay, when they got here, they actually were kind of droopy looking. Um, is that just because they were stressed? Is that because they were just weaned? Is that because um, they, this is a new environment to them or are they sick? By the time you've had them in isolation for two weeks to a month, you'll be able to have an answer as to why that is. This is a great time to monitor for signs of illness to treat disease or sickness in isolation. You know, this isn't just about new animals coming on your farm. It's also about if you have an animal in your regular herd or flock that, um, that you can separate them and take that illness away from the healthy animal so it doesn't spread rapidly. So as was mentioned in the chat, creating zones of isolation for tools, equipment, and clothing. Um, how many of us have barn shoes or um, a certain coat, coat or out um, coveralls that we use for chores? And what happens to that once it goes to the barn? Do we have a specific place we put it when we bring it back from the barn, when we wear it back from the barn? Are we being careful to keep whatever's on that away from other out, um, clothing or tools and equipment so that we're not creating a cross-contamination issue just even without really knowing it? This also goes for, goes for the visitors coming to our farm. Are we requiring them to you know, put booties on or only stay in certain areas and be isolating the, 
the risk from the, the healthy from the unhealthy. All right. The last um, part of the CHIP acronym is uh, better or proper management practices. So that B in CHIP is a little bit more complicated. <laughs> proper management practices. And I want to draw your attention to um, a bulletin that I published in 2021 with the University of Idaho Extension. And it was called Livestock Care for Beginning and Small Scale Producers. And we'll have it, the link is here at the bottom. It's bulletin 1001. And um, so in that bulletin, I discussed five principles of caring for um, livestock. And even if you're not new to caring for livestock, I know that's in the title for beginning and small scale producers. Uh, I feel like these five principles were really, really important um, in, in, in raising livestock, raising healthy livestock. Three of the principles in particular can be related to biosecurity. And that's the power of observation, knowing the signs of a healthy animal and preventing illness and disease. So best practices in these areas include things like being able to recognize the signs of a healthy animal. And if you don't know what a, a healthy animal looks like, how will you be able to tell when it's not healthy or when some kind of treatment needs to happen before it's too late? So there's a chart in the bulletin about different types of livestock and what signs are of a healthy animal in that type of livestock and what to look for when it's when it's not feeling well so that you know when you need to act. And I love the power of observation because you can spend time, spend a little time every day while you're feeding your animals, while you're caring for them, just watch their behavior. Notice, are they, um, are they coming to get a drink like they should? Have they been eating? Are they off their feed? Are they interacting with their fellow animals in a normal and healthy way? And those simple things, that simple act of observing your animals can actually go really long ways in properly maintaining their health because you can catch things earlier. You can, um, you just have an understanding like, oh, that's always the way that chicken acts. It's just always that way. It's not really sick. It just um, is that chicken's attitude or it is the way this sheep interacts with the world. And he always sounds like that. He doesn't have a sore throat. He just always sounds like that. Those kind of things. You don't know those things unless you're spending the time to get to know your animals and just observing their normal behavior. Some other best practices, um, vaccination protocols comes up again here in the idea of keeping healthy animals healthy. I don't know how many times I've said that in this webinar, but thinking about the value of what's the same, um, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So what can you do ahead of time to mitigate the risk of, um, of illness or disease coming onto your farm by having good vaccination protocols for your animals. And uh, we also here on this slide, um, managing what's coming on and leaving your farm people and animals. That's an important part of proper management practices. So I encourage you to read the bulletin, not just because I wrote it and I think it's great, but because I think it could help in, um, in thinking through things in a different way and find uh, developing those best practices so that you can um, keep your, thank you McKinley for linking that in the chat. Appreciate that. All right, we've talked quite a bit in um, tip number two. So about these, about best management practices with biosecurity. So I want to take just a second in the, in the note capture, I know that you can't, uh, necessarily unmute and talk to me, but I'd like to get a little bit of a feedback of how how you think your farm is doing um, with these sorts of things. So if you're willing, I want you to take a couple of minutes and reflect on the risks on your property. What is it that you might be concerned about? Is it visitors? Is it um, you know, maybe you're downstream of a, a large operation that you're concerned about your water cleanliness? Um, do you not have an established place to keep sick animals away from healthy animals? What are some risks on your operation that um, you can record just so you know, like, okay, this is something I need to deal with um, as part of your plan that we're going to make here in the next step? 
And if you're willing, put some of those in the chat. Let me know what kind of risks that you are experiencing on your farm. So I went through this and thinking about my farm. Um, one of our pain points in the last couple of years was we didn't have a great place to feed our cattle in the winter. We had a feed bunk and um, as the cows would come up to the feed bunk, it would get super mucky and super deep. And we actually lost a cow. Um, I came out one morning to do the chores and she had gotten stuck in the mud and couldn't get out. And she, I were pretty sure she suffocated. She was carrying a nearly full term calf. And it was a really devastating loss just personally because I love our cow family. And the idea that, gosh, we could have done this differently. This was something that um, we could have done. We could have prevented. Um, so this year, one of the investments we made in our property was uh, we poured a cement slab at the feed bunk. And it was amazing to have the cows stand on cement this year. Did the cement get mucky? Sure. Um, it got a little mucky leading up to the cement, but through the winter, the cows were not standing in muck knee deep uh, just because of winter. And that was actually a, a management practice that I think can, uh, I think we could have prevented the loss of that cow last year. And it's also impacting the cleanliness of our feed area. And it's a, something that I think will actually also impact the health of our, of our cattle long-term as they come to the feed bunk every winter. So that's, that's an example from our place. Um, so I see having an um, area to isolate sick chickens. Now that can be that can be difficult. And the wild birds again, being able to, what can we do about wild birds? If you're in the poultry business, the avian flu is a big deal this year. I mean, even even down to our backyard flocks for our youth and our forage program, we canceled the poultry show at the fair. So it's something that impacts all across the the um, system. And how can you keep your animals safe? Um, similar issue with cattle, too muddy in the winter. And it, you know, you don't think about mud being an issue like health-wise, but there is actually you, um, data to show that if animals are standing in, in mud, they're not, they're using their body temperature, cattle, they're using their body temperature to stay warm and try to and fight off that. Um, I mean, would you like to stand in mud all the time? And it, they, their feed conversion rate isn't as good. They, they're using their energy in ways that are less efficient for them in that setting. Um, so that comes from feedlot cattle data, but it, the, the same would work on, on our home place. All right, we'll move on to tip number three, which is make a plan. So on the, uh, some of the handouts that came was a handout called the note catcher. I love that title actually. So it's a place for you to um, gather your thoughts. And even if you didn't get that and you don't have it printed, whatever, you can just use a piece of paper. So um, the first thing in part of making a plan was, uh, and this is a screenshot from the note catcher, is three things you can do to mitigate the risk on your property. So something that you um, just did thinking through, thinking through the risks, what risks do you have? What are three things you can do to mitigate those risks? So my risk was um, an, an area that wasn't safe or clean for feeding. That was one of my risks. And um, so what was something I could do? I could pour some cement. What do I need to have that? What do I need to carry that out? Um, we knew we, we had the space. Um, what resources did I need, but I didn't already have? We had to save up the money because cement is crazy expensive these days. <laughs> but, um, and we needed to find a company. I didn't, we weren't gonna do it ourselves. We wanted to hire somebody to do it. So this part of this presentation about making a plan is really about you thinking through what's going on in your property and thinking through what it is that you, you can do. Because, um, uh, and if you need ideas on what to do and you just, you're just kind of stuck, I'd be happy to visit with you about that and just flesh out with you what your situation is and how what your options might be. So uh, it's a little bit difficult in a webinar situation for us to, for us to have this conversation. But, um, so I, I'm happy for you to call me sometime if you want to and visit with this more in depth. But I want you to take just a few seconds, a few minutes, a couple minutes, and think about what are things you can do to mitigate the risks on your property? What resources do you already have? And um, what resources do you need? 
And then the second part of that making a plan is pair that resource with, okay, this is what I need. This is why we need it. This is where I can get it. And this is when I will get it done. The done word got caught up, caught up on, the, on the graph there, but it is, um, um, well, I guess when I will get it is also good enough. But I want you to think through not just, oh yeah, we need that thing out there in the orb, but when are you going to get it? Where are you going to get it? And when are you going to get it? And make that plan and make it happen. Because um, not having things written down, what is it about? They say about goals, a goal that's not written down is just a wish. Uh, and you, uh, you owe it to yourself, to your livestock, to be able to make these things happen to um, to ensure their health and safety. And also it could be about the profitability of your of your enterprise that you're doing. You know, if you're chickens, if you lose half your flock because of avian flu and all you could have done is covered the area in which they live or keep the wild bird feeder away from their feed and you know separated that, just like my cow that we lost. Um, if we had just done one simple thing, we might not have lost that resource. And it makes a big impact, particularly in the small acreage, small, small scale production. Uh, be able to um, keep all of your animals in production and be able to have them um, producing at the rate that they're like the best rate that they can. So tell me in the chat, if you would, some things that um, that come to mind for you and resources that you need and where uh, to mitigate some of the risks on your property. I thought through, as you're doing that, I thought through a few things that, um, depending on the type of livestock you're, you have on your property, what some examples of um, things that you can do if you're having a little trouble coming up with that. We could, um, so say you are raising young livestock, like you have a maternal herd. And um, your whole goal is to, or herd or flock, whether it's sheep or chickens, your whole goal is to raise babies, whatever kind of babies they are, baby goats, baby sheep, baby chickens, baby cows, baby alpacas, um, baby whatever. And your whole goal is to sell those babies to the next person, to the next person. So they can have great genetics like you have, and they can raise their own, and you're a supplier of the next generation. So thinking through the kind of things that you might have on your property that will um, mitigate those risks. All right, so I have a maternal cow herd. What do I do to keep my baby animals safe? So it's really important for me that I am uh, vaccinating my mother cows on a regular basis. They're vaccinated for things that can prepare their baby for a good start. Um, they get a vaccine before uh, the, the calves come, they can be vaccinated for uh, scours, for example. The mom can be vaccinated and those antibodies from that vaccine are carried through the colostrum when that calf is first born and it helps the calf get a good healthy start. So that's something I can do in my maternal cow herd. And I, there are similar things you can do in, in other breeds of livestock as well. Okay, so now the vaccines, make sure my cows are healthy, make sure the animals are, are born in a Place. So if I have my cows, like look about, think about what I talked about with the muck around my feed bunk. So once the calves start getting a little big, they want to come with their moms to the feed bunk. Picture that in your mind. Moms are standing in, you know, up to their ankles in muck. Their tiny babies want to come up with their mom to the feed bunk. Babies get stuck in mud a lot easier than big cows get stuck in the mud. So that's a risk on my property for the baby cows, the calves to get stuck in the mud behind their mothers. They're just doing what they do. They're just curious. They wanna be up at the feed bunk. They're curious about what is this you're feeding my mother? I wanna try it. And so every year we get a little stressed out when the babies start to be mobile enough that they wanna eat at the feed bunk too. Uh, this year it was much better because they, they didn't have access because uh, the muck wasn't as bad. And, um, the 
So that was something to keep my baby animals healthy. I, I we made a choice and actually it impacted the babies. The, the cement impacted the babies and we weren't even expecting it to, but it uh, is something that we think about every year. We actually calve in the in January, February. Sometimes it's a muddy time. Sometimes it's a frozen time. Uh, that's a management practice we've chosen. When it's a frozen time, it's actually awesome because having babies in rain and snow and cold and wet is really hard on babies. So, but even having it in the frozen time is actually easier on them if, unless it's like super cold. We had we did end it up with a calf that got a little frostbite on its ear this year because um, the temperatures dropped that night that she was born. But um, we also had a calf born the night that it dropped to five degrees and he spent the night in the leather shop in my husband's leather shop because it was too cold for the babies to be outside. All of those things can be things on my maternal herd that I'm thinking of. Not only caring for the mothers, but caring for the babies when they first come and there's most sensitive times and then making sure that we take care of their vaccinations to be able to sell them. We did sell our animals to our neighbor. He's gonna raise them. And um, so he knows, he came to our branding. He helped brand the calves. He's buying those calves and he's gonna take them to their next step of life to be able to connect, connect, connect those dots in the history. Some of the um, things that are coming in the chat, um, a good question about pouring cement in a chicken pen. Being able to keep your, um, your animal area clean of waste is just so important for the health of the animals and even the health of you. Like as you're handling your animals, it's not healthy for you to walk into a pen that's knee deep in chicken poop either, let alone having your chickens in there all the time. So a cement in a chicken pen could be helpful. Um, one of the things that it might prevent is sometimes people like to deep bed their chickens and um, create a good, like, uh, almost like a composting environment in the chicken pen. And the, the dust baths that the chickens like to have, um, I don't know that you'd want to pour cement over your whole chicken pen just to keep, if your chickens were contained all the time, but it would be a way that you could prevent, you could make cleaning easier. Like if maybe just poured cement under the roost. That might make cleaning easier for when you um, are trying to keep your pens clean. Do the work in the summer to prepare for a wet winter. Absolutely, that is a great, great thing to do. Thinking ahead of, okay, what did we struggle with last winter when the conditions were too crummy to get outside and do anything about it? And what can we do this summer to prepare for that next summer? Yep, that's when we poured the cement was last fall for sure. Because we knew the winter was coming again. So another good question about covering a large outdoor poultry pen. Um, I mean, there's ways. Of, um, a lot of people that raise uh, raise like guineas or uh, quail, people that have aviators have big nets that they drape over their pens. It also could be about um, making sure that your the feed sources or whatever is attracting the wild birds is contained in an area that the birds just don't need to come into your wild, into your pen with your poultry. Um, so their, the poultry feed is in a place where only the poultry, only the chickens can get to it rather than out just in the feed yard attracting. I know at my house, the magpies will clean out my chicken feeder in a heartbeat if they can get to it. So um, making it so that my poultry can get to my chicken, their feed and not just the wild birds. Um, is one of the ways that you can do that. Um, research for the vaccines and what's in them. Uh, a new Idaho requirement to get certain vaccines from a veterinarian is now isn't over the counter. That's true. There is legislation that's been passed about antibiotics and, and certain vaccines and medications that you can't just buy over the counter that you have to go to your vet. It's really important. I didn't talk about that in the, in the CHIP acronym. It's really important to have a good relationship with a veterinarian so that you can um, uh, develop those vaccination protocols with them. They can give you guidance on that, especially if you're new to what do I, what do my animals even need? There's a lot of um, question in the world today about are vaccines necessary? If my animals never leave my property, why do I need them? I've never had this illness here. All of those kind of things. And at some point, your animals are going to be marketed, um, possibly, maybe not always. But um, if you're in this as a as a business you are impacting the greater food supply, the greater supply of animals in the world. So having a good relationship with your veterinarian is very important and making sure you know what you can get over the counter and what you have to get from your vet. 
Um, biosecurity for gardens and crops is also important. Great point. The the one handout that, that came with your um, with the the presentation today is a biosecurity checklist. And um, and Colette, our moderator today, put this handout together. And it's really great. It has a section about biosecurity in general, biosecurity of animals, and biosecurity of crops. And as I was putting this together, I really thought about that we could do a whole nother webinar just about biosecurity with crops and gardens, because the, I mean, the routes of contamination are essentially the same um, in a lot of ways. Tools and equipment, clothing, people, our hands, um, us, um, you know, your shoes, and the pathogens that are impacting the gardens and crops are essentially come from manure or um, other diseases from between between crops, but all the principles of isolating healthy from sick or um, diseased from not diseased, all the principles remain the same. It's really important to think through, okay, I just shoveled poop out of the horse pen with this shovel. Um, now I'm going to go to the garden and dig up my potatoes. Well, <laughs> is should you clean your shovel first? Probably would be a good idea. Um, and we think, oh, well, we'll just wash it off later. Well, are your is your food being washed adequately to take care of those things? Can you just do some things to mitigate that risk and not have it be an issue at all, for sure? All right. Um, Cindy agrees with planning in the summer for the winter months. Uh, redo the area around the feeder. Research the best material that will work for our budget and what will work for the cattle. That's a big deal, too. You know, pouring cement isn't in everybody's everybody's budget or putting down rock or, um, so what could we do differently? We could, in our situation, um, we could actually feed out in the pasture. We don't have to feed at a bunk, um, but then there's other things involved in that. We could lose some hay because the, they stand on it, they, they urinate on it, all of those things, and then they don't eat it. And hay is really expensive, so the bunk is really a great idea for that. All those things, working out your budget, figuring out what will work best for your animals. And um, and I like and depending on when you're having offspring, you know, what do those offspring need at different seasons of the year? A couple of years ago for my birthday, um, so that uh, orphan calf was actually a birthday present. Um, I was a, a family consumer science educator at the time. We lived in Utah and um, my husband called me. I was at a family consumer science conference to everybody they were talking about nutrition and, and home economics things. And my husband calls me and says, I got you a birthday present. I'm like, I'm like, great, what is it? He's like, it's a baby cow. And I was so excited. <laughs> and my colleagues just thought I was crazy. But um, so it's not the first time I've gotten a birthday of animals for my birthday. One year I got chickens for my birthday, baby chicks. My birthday's in April and April in Idaho, as we know, is not always the most wonderful environment for baby chicks. It was cold and rainy. We had to keep them under a heat lamp for several weeks and we didn't have a place in the house to do it. So they ended up in the leather shop under a heat vent, my husband's leather shop. And then there was dust all over the sewing machines and all over the things from the baby chickens. And I realized that it's great to get chickens for my birthday in April, but it really was a pain. Let's get chickens in May when they can be outside under a heat lamp and not having to be, well, this May it might not have worked either, but thinking through when's best for the babies. It works for my cattle. Didn't really work very great for my chickens. Thank you everybody for putting things in your in your chat, in the chat about ways that you're gonna, the pain points, the resources that you need to make this plan on your property. Uh, I'm pretty well wrapped up with the content that I had today. Are there any questions that have come up for you about biosecurity in, um, in what we've talked about today? Things that you might need to, or a problem that you're not sure how to solve. What are things that come up for you in, when it comes to how you are gonna make this plan and carry out this um, way to protect your, your livestock, your crops, and ultimately yourself? And your family, even like if your customers, all those things on your property, creating a biosecurity plan that's encompassing for all of those groups. Are there any questions that have come up for you along the way today that I can help with?
We haven't had any questions come into the Q&A box yet or into the chat, but if we have some, will you take some time to answer those? I do have a question for you, Rebecca. This goes back to your point that it's important to have a really good relationship with a veterinarian. How would you suggest people find a veterinarian that actually understands livestock? That is a great question. And um, as you were asking that, I was thinking about too, if you're raising unique livestock, not every not every veterinarian knows your livestock. Um, you know, there's in rural areas, a lot of times there's large animal veterinarians, people that focus on cattle or horses, um, but not everybody knows about sheep or pigs or poultry. Um, so don't be afraid to shop around a little bit. Uh, one of the things that I cover in the in the bulletin is about seeking out quality resources. You can get all kinds of information from Google, <laughs> from the World Wide Web about how to solve whatever problems you're experiencing. But the value of the veterinarian isn't just that um, that you can get the 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 medication that you might need that you can't get over the counter, but that someone is they have a vested interest in your animals too, right? They're they want you to succeed. Um, sure, they want you as a customer, but when you have a, a, a relationship with your veterinarian, they can um, kind of follow your journey of your animals. They understand why it's important to you. They understand that you have a business model and that that's important to them. So if you don't have a right relationship, shop around. Um, other things you can do is talk to other people who are in your same boat. Like if you're... Um, if you're raising a specific type of livestock, say poultry, and you have a problem, um, your peers in poultry production can be great mentors and great, you know, they can they can help you through solving some of those problems maybe that you don't have to get to a vet, the vet level um, to solve, but they might also know the vet in your greater area that is the poultry one that you can talk to. So talk to your peers and find out who they're using. And that's one way to figure it out. And then don't be afraid to, to shop around and figure out which, which vet's gonna work best for you. Uh, sometimes you don't click with the vet and that's okay. Um, I know down here in our area, I met um, a veterinarian. She says, I've always loved poultry. So I end up answering the poultry questions in our clinic and it's fine with me. So she came and spoke at one of our classes and I imagine she would be, um, willing to con consult over the phone if someone's from far away that they, they just don't have a poultry person and I can put you in contact with that vet. Sometimes those specific species vets are hard to find, it's true. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. I see we have a question that has come into the chat and first we had a comment that in purchasing st steers, sometimes they come with ringworm. And then a question from Marcy about how do we deal with that this year and next year? How long does ringworm hang around on mangers and squeeze shoots? And uh, uh, let's see. You know, yeah, is so there an immunity that comes if people act, or if the livestock actually get ringworm? Yeah, ringworm is something. So there's different levels of things, right? So I'm not a veterinarian, so I'm not going to give you medical advice. Um, I haven't had ringworm on my own, my own cattle. Um, so I, I don't have specific experience with that. So it would be something to speak to somebody, speak to a vet about it and see what the, what the level of threat is, right? Is it a fungus that people are just going to get and it doesn't actually impact their health? It's ugly, um, like, you know, cattle with warts and, and things on their, on their face. Yeah, they're not very, they're not very pleasant to look at. If you're going to market your cattle, people might be like, oh, you have an issue. Um, Sore mouth and sheep um, is another one of those things like, oh man, that's kind of a big deal. And ringworm can also be persistent. I know there's people that um, it, it goes through the show, the sheep show uh, world or the livestock show world. And so some people won't go to certain facilities because they know, oh, last time we went to that facility, we came home with XYZ issue. And that's another reason why those biosecurity measures are really important. What do you know about the places where you're getting your animals? Um, what um, and where you're taking your animals if you're moving them around to um, shows or different facilities. I, as far as the um, the ringworm, um, I don't have the answers as far as how long it it hangs out in the in the facility. Um, 
So I, I would direct you to speak to a vet about those things. But that is a great point about it being, it can be a persistent problem in the soil. You get some, you get certain viruses or issues, health issues, and they get into your soil that can, it can really just impact your production for a long time. It's really important to practice these principles of isolation and understanding the history and understanding where you're going and um, what your the risk is of bringing things home with you. Even, you know, going to the county fair, you walk around livestock farms, what are you bringing home with you when you go back to your own animals at home? Um, <laughs> when I get talking about biosecurity, sometimes they get to be a germaphobe and I'm like, ooh, there's germs everywhere. <laughs> and what am I bringing home? But um, it's important to pay attention. I don't know if I answered your question very well, Marcy. But um, you could make that call. If you're purchasing steers and you go to look at the steers and you see that they have warts or ringworm or something that just is you don't want on your property, there are other steers in the world to purchase. There are other livestock from other places. Um, the price might be different. The situation might be different. But if it's important enough to you to not bring that home to your property, make that choice as a as a consumer, as a customer to protect your own, protect your facility from bringing home anything that might impact it that way. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for participating by chat, everyone, and Rebecca for your presentation today. I'm going to go ahead and let's let's see. I'm going to go ahead and ask you if you might stop your share, Rebecca. And then I'm going to actually share one more picture. So some of you may have noticed when you registered today or when you registered for this webinar, actually, that we had a note on it, that there was an opportunity for you to be able to receive a free set of booties if you completed our post-webinar evaluation. And the reason that we can offer these free booties is that we have support from a USDA beginning farmer rancher grant. And so we're really hoping that we receive your feedback. And if we do, you'll have an opportunity to put your name and address in, and we will send you a free package of 100 disposable boot covers. And those can be extremely useful for you when you have visitors to the farm and they're coming into your area, or if you want to use them when you're in your livestock area and then take them off when you're going to do other things on your farm with those particular boots or shoes that you're wearing. So the evaluation is going to generate automatically when we end the webinar today. I will also make sure that you receive an email tomorrow that has a link to that evaluation. If you're watching the recording, you can contact me at cdefelps at uidaho.edu, and I'd be happy to send you that link to the evaluation so you could also sign up to get a free package of booties. Thank you again, Rebecca, for your great presentation and sharing so many resources about biosecurity for your small acreage farm and for the resources that you shared about animal health and the great offer that anyone can connect with you as well. And Rebecca's email is rmills at uidaho.edu. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And we will definitely look forward to seeing you on a future Cultivating Success webinar or program. Have a great day.